I am going to go through quite a bit of material today, mainly covering, or today's seminar is mainly going to cover kind of the larger background for glass as a structural material, followed by an overview of the various code provisions um, that are out there uh, and a few design guidelines. So I'm going to take one big first chunk, which may be longer than the 45 minutes that Maria suggested, followed by a break um, and then two shorter segments. And that first chunk is really going to the the intent of it is to get into what is glass as a structural material why do we have to look at it differently than other materials? Um, and what is its basis? I do find it uh, somewhat unfortunate and hopefully something that will be changing uh, at some point in the future, that engineering courses, uh, particularly university programs, do not cover glass as a material at all. And so I, I do find it important to cover what is the material that we're talking about so that we can better understand uh, how we would design it. I would like to thank the cost working group in Europe. Um, this is a group that was put together. It's, it was a conglomeration of um, researchers, practicing professionals, and so on uh, for a number of years in Europe. Much of the material in this presentation comes from a number of presentations that were given by that group. Um, and so I do need to say thanks to them uh, as, as they formed a large basis for quite a bit of this work or what you'll see today. So to start with, why are we discussing glass as a material and why, why perhaps haven't we been discussing it before um, or as much before as engineers and what's, what's different than where we were in the past? So glass as a material is quite important in building applications in particular because it's what allows us to actually engage with the outside world. It's what allows us to have some type of transparency um, in exterior facades and instead of just being inside with no natural light or no connection to what is going on outside, we can use glass to actually have some connection. And there's been quite a bit of evolution uh, in glass as a material used in buildings over many hundreds of years, um, from, from when it was used mainly in small window applications to today, uh, where we see glass used in, in applications well beyond windows, and where glass can really provide an element that provides so much transparency and so much connection um, that there is, in fact, no uh, opacity at all. We see full transparency. And so there's, there has been quite an evolution um, and another evolution currently happening, namely in regards to sustainability and whether or not we should have fully transparent facades, um, both in terms of uh, the operational energy requirements of a building, but also in terms of the amount of embodied carbon that goes into creation of glass as a material. I think there's a lot of question marks out there. So we'll see kind of where things go and how things evolve as we move forward. A few examples of how glass can be used to provide transparency. So this is a roof of a medical school in Glasgow. So here we have structural glass beam elements um, connected to a glass skylight. Uh, you can see, and if you look closely in all of these images I'm about to show, you'll see various connection uh, pieces, which I think are important to point out. So here we have one, two, three pieces of glass that form this beam, and they're connected by these kind of splice details. So it provides this really nice effect. You have full kind of connection to um, the roof and the sky. We see a number of stair applications. These are, I think, at, at first they were mainly used as kind of dem demonstrative uh, vehicles for glass, but you do see installations in a variety of places. Here we have a glass element that forms both the handrail and the beam element, the stringer that spans from ground up to the top of this stair. Of course, the, the classic Apple stores, which I think really pushed glass in building applications and have helped to push uh, both how glass is used, but also the manufacturing capabilities of glass elements. And there has been quite a progression in, in these types of structures over the last 20 years in particular. I think this Apple store in Shanghai is a particularly good example of all of the different types of elements that you can use when using glass in a structural application. Here, here we have curved glass wall elements, we have glass column elements, we have glass beam elements across the roof uh, and glass roofing elements. This is kind of the entry to this store. When you walk down and in, um, there is a continuation of glazing. So it's glass that invites you in and glass that brings you down to below uh, with a curved glass stringer with glass tread elements. I think this is a quite impressive example um, and probably the best example that you could really look to as, as using glass in, in, in all forms. So what is glass? 
there's a variety of types of glass out there. There's, there's natural glass um, in the form of obsidian and moldavite. Uh, both of these come from volcanic um, instances in which uh, volcano uh, volcanic activity compresses various elements to the point where it forms something that we would call glass. And fulgurite, um, which is, it, it happens less rarely. This is when an asteroid or meteor or some, some other uh, skyborne uh, object crashes into the earth. Um, let's say it crashes into a desert and sand is heated very suddenly to the point where it forms a rock-like element that would be considered glass. Glass at its root is uh, originally a crystalline material, so they formed of silicone dioxide with a quite um, uh, regular uh, chemical makeup. Uh, that starts to become amorphous when we look at silica glass and then with the introduction of sodium atoms into glass, which was done purposefully in order to reduce the melting temperature of the compound, we have a much more amorphous structure than what we originally had. 